So I, uh, I checked my computer this morning, and um, I have 25,807 music files on my computer. That comes out to about 66 days and 15 hours worth of music. It's a lot. It's more than the average person has. Um, that makes some sense, because part of what I do is to teach about music. It's something that I've done for the better part of two decades, to teach about the history of African American music in particular. Um, it's also been a life passion. But here's the interesting thing as I sat and looked at that number and then thought about some other numbers. What used to be the kind of record collection that someone like I would have had before the digital age is now what everyone has. Based on the best numbers that we have available, the average American who owns a computer or a digital device has about 7,000 music files on their computer or on their device. That comes out to about 10 to 15 days worth of music, or to put it another way, somewhere between 500 and 700 albums. We live in an age when we are all record collectors. And that was not always the case. Just a decade or so ago, being a record collector was something that only a select few did and only a select few had access to. People who had the money, the time, the passion, took the effort to collect, to sort, to classify, to listen to that much music. Now everybody has it. The internet has transformed the way that we listen to music. It has changed our access to it. It has made it possible for everyone to be a record collector. This is, in my opinion, one of the great triumphs of the World Wide Web and of the internet. The ability that we all have now to have access to massive amounts of information, access to a variety of popular culture, of music, of art that we didn't have before. But it also changes the way that we listen to music. And part of the challenge is that we live in an age when how we listen to music has become, in many ways, the dominant question of our, of our musical culture and of our culture more generally. It's about the new ways in which we can obtain the music, the new ways in which we can hear it, how we can carry it around and transmit it. Now, this is not the first time that how we listen to music has been an important part of our experience with music. It's always an important part of our experience with music, going all the way back to thinking about how instruments were invented, thinking about how we started to record music, how we started to listen to it with each new form, whether it was a record or a CD or a tape. The way in which we listen to music, how we listen to music has been changed. But it's also true that although how we listen to music is always part of the reasons why we listen to music, it's also true that there's a balance that shifts between thinking about how we listen to it and thinking about why we listen to it. And I think it's safe to say that over the past 10 years or so, the reasons how, the reasons how we listen to music, the way we listen to music, has been increasingly important at the expense in many ways of why we listen to it or of what the music is. This is particularly true because we live at a time when we have all of this information and we have something of an obsession with newness, of always getting the newest thing, the latest thing. It's something that the culture and the economy demands of us and that we as consumers often willingly accept. Well, I'm here today to issue a reminder. A reminder that the most important thing about music is why we listen to it. Why did someone create that music? Why does someone go through the trouble to produce it? What kind of message do they want to send with the music that they've created? Why does the audience like it or dislike it? Why do communities define themselves in part by what that music is? Because how we listen to music has become such a dominant and important part of the world of music today, we often overlook this question of why the music matters, of why it's important. Now again, this is kind of common sense, right? Why does the music matter? Well, because we care about it. I get it. This is a reminder. It's not a revelation. But the fact that we care about it 
is not the only part of the story. Now, caring about it is really important. Uh, the, ultimately, why do we care about music? Why does music matter? Because it affects us in some way. It makes us feel, it makes us think, it makes us laugh or cry. We can hear in it the experiences that we've had. We can relate to something new about it. We can hear a sound we've never heard before. At some basic level, the individual experience we have with music is important. And in the same way that it's a great triumph that how we listen to music has changed, so too is it ultimately foundational that the reasons why we listen to music is something personal. But it's also something a little bit bigger than that. It's also about how we understand one another, how we define what our communities are, how we share our sense of morals and ethics and values, how we talk about ourselves, how we share in the pain that we experience, how we talk about the hopes that we might have for one another. And music has had this power as long as we've had music. Music is a way in which we have defined our civilizations. If you go back, if you think about how we have defined ourselves as people, it has often been through epic poems, stories, and tales that were told how? They were told by singing. They were sung or they were spoken to musical accompaniment. And they were transmitted orally from one generation to the next until the time came when you could write them down. But just because you could write them down didn't mean that people stopped singing them. It didn't mean that they stopped talking over music. In fact, that continued onward. That never stopped, and it still exists today. And that capacity that we have then to understand each other through music is something that I think is a reminder worth remembering at a time when the economy and the technology encourages us to sort, encourages us to literally turn music into files, something that you put away, a source of reference. Instead, what I'm saying is, let's try to find that balance and think about why the music matters. Now, a lot of very wise, smart people have talked about why the music matters, and they've thought of ways to categorize it and think about it so that it makes sense so that you can connect from one generation to the next, from one period to another, from one genre or style to another. And they've done it in a variety of ways, a lot of ways both obvious and clever. You, obviously, you can connect why music is important or how people express important things through the music through emotions, right? Happy, sad, triumphant, despondent. You can organize them by where they came from. What country did the music come from? When did it happen? How did it happen? Who was responsible for it? These are, in fact, the most common ways in which we organize our music, and they're the most deeply connected, I would add, to the technology that we use. Think about any kind of music file service that you have. It lists the date that it was created, you know, when you got it, where it came from, the album that it was from. But what I want to offer today is the way of thinking about why music matters that has meant the most to me the way that has really transformed and allowed me to understand in a broader way how music is connected from one generation to the next, how it's connected from one side of the world to the other, the way that I teach about music. And that way is to think about the impulse that drove a musician to listen to music and the impulse that drives an audience to pay attention. Now, what is an impulse? Well, an impulse at a very fundamental level is a sort of almost uncontrollable urge to do something, right? You, you can't control yourself from doing it. You do it impulsively. You act almost without thinking because you so desperately need to do it. For musicians, that impulse is an impulse to create. It's an impulse to share your voice with the world, whether it's through playing an instrument or singing, whether it's through writing a song, writing lyrics. It's about that impulse and that need to create. The great African-American writer, Ralph Ellison, was the first to really think about the idea of an impulse in terms of music, and American music culture in particular. He talked about the blues impulse that exists in American, African-American life. He called it an autobiographical chronicle of personal catastrophe expe expressed lyrically. What that really meant was that it was about survival. 
and it was about how someone will survive in an imperfect world, that you resign yourself to the imperfectibility of the world and you just try to make the best of it. Well, this notion, this notion of trying to survive is at the heart of what we consider the music known as the blues, that music that came primarily out of the period from the 1920s to the 1950s, that talks about survival, that talks about trying to make the best of an imperfect world, that talks about trying to deal with heartbreak and pain. But it's not just about blues music itself. The whole point of the impulse is that you can hear it in other kinds of music, in other styles. You can hear it elsewhere. And so the blues is also there in the cry of Otis Redding, or in the scream of Prince, or in the rage of NWA. You can hear it in Hank Williams, and you can hear it in Janis Joplin. You can hear it in Metallica. You can hear it in Eminem. It's about that impulse, that need to talk about your sense that this imperfect world is, is, is making you suffer, and then laughing or crying or dancing your way out of it. My friend Craig Werner in his book, A Change is Gonna Come, built upon this idea of the blues impulse. He talked about the gospel impulse and the jazz impulse, and he talked about how these impulses are a different perspective on the world, but yet one that people feel compelled to present. The gospel impulse is about redemption. It's not about believing that the world is imperfect so much as it is about understanding the world is imperfect, but then trying to make that world more perfect, living up to the standards that you have created for yourself and your community and society, living up to the religious codes of the gospel, uh, that the gospel would have spread, or in more secular terms, the political, the social, the philosophical underpinnings of what would make a good and a decent society. But I know, surprise, this is the music of the civil rights movement. This is the music of Motown and Stax and Sam Cooke and Curtis Mayfield. These are the sounds of looking for redemption. That jazz impulse was something else entirely. If the blues impulse was about accepting the world the way it is, and if the gospel impulse is about accepting or about attempting to perfect the world as it is, the jazz impulse is about imagining the world differently altogether. It's about breaking it down to its component parts, questioning your preconceptions about it, and then rebuilding it in a new and a different way, thinking about it differently. That's what jazz music did. It broke the rules of how music was supposed to work and then created a new version of music, a new way to see the world. But it too is not just about jazz. It's about Jimi Hendrix and the innovations he created. It's about Parliament Funkadelic and what George Clinton did. It's about Eric B. and Rakim and what hip hop innovators created. It's about this impulse to reimagine the world in a new way. Now, how do we hear that impulse? Well, we hear that impulse in a number of different ways. As a historian, you won't be surprised to hear that I think learning some music history helps you hear the impulses. Knowing why something happened is based on knowing how it happened, knowing where it happened, when, knowing the connections in history and the way in which that conversation, that call and response has been going on throughout the ages. But here's something else. Every once in a while, challenge your own preconceptions. In fact, I want you to go further than challenging your own preconceptions. I want you to assume your taste in music is terrible. Assume it's bad. Assume that you're wrong about all of the music that's out there. And go back and listen to some music that you've chosen to ignore. Or listen to some music that you don't like at all, that you actively dislike. And then instead of listening for the sounds that you dislike or the artists that, that you're disturbed by or where it came from, think about why the music matters. Think about the impulse that is in there that can connect what you care about to what someone else cares about when they hear that music. And why do you do that? Why does that matter? Well, it matters because, well, first of all, it can be something as simple as understanding that that teen pop song that your granddaughter plays incessantly while you're babysitting is not all that different than the music you listened to when you were a kid. Or that that song and that album and that artist that your grandfather tells you every time you see him that you gotta go check out might be worth checking out. But it also means more than what happens at the family dinner table. This is also about understanding that you can find wisdom in unexpected places, that you can hear something important or something that you connect to in a music and culture that maybe you don't understand, maybe you'll never even love, but can speak to you in some way. And this is particularly important because it's the poor it's the less fortunate, it's the young, it's the forgotten, who use music more than ever to have their voice heard. 
Music is a way in which they can speak to the world about their hopes and their fears when more conventional outlets for social or political dialogue are unavailable to them. It's about hearing the soldiers who fight in Iraq and Afghanistan, who have built their own recording studios in the field of battle to write songs about the experience that they've had. It's about the people of the Gulf Coast after Katrina within days, writing songs hoping for survival and crying out in pain and what they have to say about the experience that they've had. It's about a struggling middle class speaking through country music and pop music about trying to maintain their standard of living. It's about the least fortunate in metal and in hip hop expressing their rage and demanding justice. You ignore those voices at your own risk. But instead of taking that risk, instead of taking that risk, make the most of the technology that is available. Use this new way to hear music. Use how you listen to music to think more deeply about why you listen to music. Resist how the technology and how the market wants you to purchase, wants you to cultivate, wants you to build a wall around the music that you've created, only, uh, or a wall around the music that you own, only to then bring in more, bring in more, bring in more, and take a moment and think about why that music matters, and particularly think about why it matters when you go and you use that technology as it's intended to go and listen to music that you could have never heard before where you can go and have the experience of being a record collector, where you can hear music from a different culture and from a different world, and maybe a different experience than the one that you've had, and make those connections. Figure out why the music mattered to them and how that why connects to you, how you share that impulse that we so often share collectively as human beings. This is the opportunity that you have before you if you listen carefully.